Welcome back to the Goldmark Gallery for another Goldmark TV broadcast. We're here in the, the front room of the gallery. Uh, later today we're going to have a look at some Nick Collins pots, uh, but if you hadn't guessed already from that trailer we just saw, uh, today's going to be a real focus on David Hockney. Uh, I'm standing in front of this fantastic, enormous book produced by Tashin that you've just seen modelled by Mike. And uh, looking through, this is giving me a window into the, the defining moments of, of, of Hockney, uh, undoubtedly the best celebrated, the most successful, uh, and certainly the best known British artist, British living artist uh, uh, of his generation. Flipping through these enormous pages, you get a, an immediate feel for the, for the breadth of Hockney's career, from those uh, early paintings of poolsides in California, lit by the LA sun, to the famous double portraits, the photographic collages, or the joiners, as Hockney called them, uh, like Pear Blossom Highway, which did for photography what Braque and Picasso had done for painting 70 years earlier. Magnificent opera sets from the late 80s and early 90s. And that late rediscovery of the fantastic countryside in his native Yorkshire. At 82, Hockney has had a, an amazingly broad uh, and deep career. Art is not just what he has done, but it has been the subject of so much of his work. Uh, looking is everything to Hockney. His paintings, his prints, are all about process. They're about the problems of art how to depict things, perspective, and they are always looking back to the past, reinterpreting, reinvigorating the, uh, the way that artists have used their imagination, used their technical processes to show us the world in a different way. Today we're going to look at uh, two or three different things from, from Hockney's career that will give an idea of um, how curious he's managed to remain in all those years of painting, all those years of uh, exploring new mediums, and will give a, a, some of an idea of the, uh, the wit, uh, the warmth, the colour, uh, and, and the imagination that, that has sparked all of his work and for which he's, uh, he's known today. Born and bred in Bradford, in Yorkshire, Hockney came to the Royal College of Art in the uh, early 1960s. And it was here, uh, as part of a cohort of young British artists, that Hockney really made his name. Like his fellow artists of, the, of that generation, uh, he began as a painter, but quickly discovered uh, during his studies the joys of printmaking. Printmaking remains uh, a hugely important part of Hockney's career. You might even go as far as to say the most important. So much of what he has done has been about what can print, what is a printing machine, uh, and, and trying to expand the boundaries uh, of what that world can mean for us. I have here one of the earliest print suites that he made. Uh, this is the Cavafy suite. It's a series of illustrations that were made to accompany a new translation of, of uh, an English translation of Cavafy's poems. These are all etchings. Hockney discovered etching at the Royal College of Art and it became an important part of his early career. He made uh, three major etching suites, uh, a Rake's Progress, the Cavafy Suite, and the Grimm's Suite, which we'll see in a minute, which sort of, uh, alongside his early paintings, helped launch his career. The reason I love these prints is that I think of those early series, they have the most personal connection to Hockney. Cavafy was a, a, an Egyptian poet uh, who lived in Alexandria uh, and like Hockney uh, he was uh, gay and explored uh, a lot of his sexuality in his work. 
Hockney came to Gavafi's poems uh, completely afresh as a young man. And instead of going to Alexandria, he went to uh, Beirut, which he felt, felt was the sort of modern equivalent of that city, uh, to try and get a feel for the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, nostalgic, melancholic living that Gavafi described in his poetry. All of these image, images that you see here, Hockney made first and then decided which poems they best represented or that they best accompanied. So these are not true illustrations. These are, these are more a sort of a, a, an homage, a, an inspiration, a, a sort of a, a, a counterpoint to Kavafi's work. And in all of them you find the flavour of Kavafi's poetry, this kind of uh, gentle voyeurism, uh, the exploration of companionship and sexuality, beautifully intimate scenes, but also sort of tinged with a, with a, slight, uh, a slight sadness or a slight melancholy that you get in a lot of Kavafi's work. You'll see a lot of them involve pairs of men in these sort of interior settings. So these were friends of Hockney that he had set up in London uh, and worked up these images. In fact, I've got a particularly nice one down here. This is particularly special because along the bottom here, We've got Hockney's signature on the print. These were made in, in 1966 and published a year later. And at the time, a gay love was still illegal then. Um, and a lot of what uh, is expressed in this, in this suite is not just um, a sort of love letter to Kavafi, but also, I think, uh, a, a desire to um, to not shy away from that aspect of, of Hockney's life, from that, that element of his, of his personality. Uh, and also um, to sort of to take a stand at a, at a particularly important time. Uh, a year after this suite was completed, uh, Hockney was then living in, in LA and he flew back to the UK. And when he arrived at the airport, uh, the British airport, he was uh, arrested at customs and he had a number of, of men's health magazines uh, uh, confiscated from his bags. And it was only on threatening to sue the airport and writing uh, to gain the support of Sir Kenneth Clark, who was a hugely important art historian at the time, uh, who wrote in defence of Hockney, um, that the, the airport bowed down, uh, sent back his belongings. Uh, and it marked a sort of a pivotal point in his, in his, uh, in his early career. Uh, those beautiful paintings of poolsides in California with his male companions around the edge, the beautiful light across the water. All of that really starts here in these beautiful etchings. I've got just one more thing that I'd like to show you here as well. Typically when an etching suite is, is produced, um, once the edition has been pulled and the printers are happy to publish, the plates will be cancelled. Normally that's done fairly perfunctorily by scratching through the, the plate, a simple cross to mark the image so that it can't be reprinted. Typical of Hockney's irreverent wit, though, he liked to, to, uh, to, to make as much of, of every part of the, the process as he could. So I have here one print from the normal edition, and then beside it, here, the cancelled version of that print which if I turn this way, you can see Hockney's done with a little, uh, a little more flair than a simple cross. A year after Hockney published the Cavafi suite that we just saw, uh, he took on a, a completely new project, and that was uh, the fairy tales of the Grimm's brothers. Uh, and that led to this suite that we see here in front of us. Etching at this point in, in Hockney's life, uh, and this project in particular, becomes so important that he, he basically gave up painting for a year in order to, to dedicate himself to these images. Uh, he chose six of the original 200 or more fairy tales that the, that the brothers Grimm wrote in the, in the 19th century. 
uh, which produced 39 images. Unlike the Cavafy suite, where the images were matched to poems after the fact, uh, it was particular lines, particular images that really inspired uh, the images in this suite. Uh, often not the most prominent within the, the tale that he was telling, but often those that, are, that were most interesting to a, to a visual artist. So, for example, the story of Old Rink Rank begins with the, the line, a king built a glass mountain. You can see in Hockney's version of the glass mountain, the seeds of that, uh, that career built on thinking about the problems of picture making, of how to depict certain things, the movement of, of water and light. He tussled with the idea of how to, how to show this mountain uh, uh, for, for a number of months uh, and came up with the various different options. We have one print of a, of a foot with a, a shovel digging into a, into a glass uh, surface which breaks into shards. Uh, another shows shards crumbling off the mountain. But I think the most interesting is this, with the castle and tree bending and distorting, refracting behind this glass shape here. I think it's a, it's a genius way of, of, of showing this, this difficult image, but it, it sort of gets to the heart of what um, Hockney's picture making was to become uh, obsessed with over the, over the coming years. If the Cavafy suite was personal, intimate, and dealt with those sort of fleeting experiences of, of, of youthful love, the Grimm suite is, is quite the opposite. It, it's virtuosic. It was a kind of uh, a, a demonstration of, of uh, his wit, uh, his ingenuity, but also his, his technical expertise. And there's a number of really interesting things going on in the etchings of this suite. If we look over here at a, a print like the older Rapunzel, you'll see that Hockney has decided not to use the normal cross-hatching uh, sort of vernacular of etching, uh, the sort that you might see in, in the etchings of the early 20th century, uh, the late 19th century, and, and then back to, to Rembrandt, uh, but something uh, a little more individual. So we have this strange grid here to give this grey wall behind the Rapunzel's flowing locks. Hockney used this suite as, a, as an opportunity to experiment, to explore this, this medium and, and really get the most out of it. So if you look over here at another print, we have the aquatint areas here where you have this lovely sort of almost um, watercolour effect of the shading. But also the same grid that we had in the Rapunzel print with more scratching over it. Hockney realised with Morris Payne, his printer, who had also printed the Cavafy Suite, uh, that they could uh, etch a grid like this, re-wax the plate, and then etch again, re-wax the plate over and over to build up these depths of black and these different effects of, of the sort of cross hatches, these scratches over one another. There's a really lovely example of it in this. This is from the story, The Boy Who Left Home to Learn Fear. And you can see a beautiful combination of the, the aquatint, these sort of, they almost look, look like sort of um, rusty, abraded patches here. Completely different kind of texture that you get from the aquatint. With this wonderful, rigid, graphic building up of lines in the back. And these lovely sort of licking fingers of fire here, which anticipate all those different shapes that Hockney would explore in, in water and light in the California sun. But more than just a, a sort of a, a technical uh, show of bravado, uh, these images are infused with love of the stories. Um, they're sort of they're full of the wit and the horror at the same time that you can find in, in, in the original tales, um, and, and a, a lovely kind of um, engagement with uh, the, the, the strangest aspects of them. Uh, there's a print in particular I'd like to show you. This is he tore himself in two, 
I've actually got this print on my on my wall at home, and I love it. I love the humour of it. I love the the sort of the offbeat quirkiness of it. More than that, I love Hockney's ability to sort of take to things casually uh, and both uh, spend time looking very hard, thinking very hard about how to how to depict things, and then uh, sort of being casual with the other details. So if you look at this man here, I've always thought he lifts up his left leg here and then suddenly it's his right that's been torn off and flung over here. This was given to me as a, as a present when I was about 10 years old, I think. And it's, a, it's an image that's, that stayed with me in my, in my, uh, my early adulthood. It's one of my favourites from the suite. At this stage in his life, uh, Hockney had, had not long moved to, to LA and, and he was really in the sort of the very early years of his fame, uh, you know, this sort of um, this prodigious uh, uh, early first chapter as to his career. The Grimm Suite really represents the peak of that, that first, uh, that first e early exploration of print. And I think in every image across the suite, there's a real joy in, in tackling every aspect of picture making, the, the, the technical process. Uh, the, the thought of how to compose, how to, uh, to take which elements from which stories, um, how to translate them into a completely different medium, uh, and then just the sheer joy in the, in the, the strangeness, the silliness, um, the sort of the macabre uh, horror uh, and the beauty of, of the Grimm's stories. That joy we'll see in the next work that we're going to have a look at which is computer drawings, laser printed, a, a fantastic, unique piece in Hot Reserve. <music>
uh, a number of which uh, Hockney, in fact, has, has just uh, uh, exhibited uh, virtually in this very strange climate, which has prevented uh, uh, physical exhibitions. Computer drawings laser printed was, was one of uh, uh, many uh, different projects that Hockney took on uh, immediately after getting this new software and, and a new computer to work it. And it explores uh, some of the, the, uh, the sort of vital images that he was making at the time uh, in various other endeavours. So if we flick through, we find strange colours and vibrant textures of the sort of the early pixels, the early shadowing and blurring that you got in, in Photoshop software. A lot of the designs that we see in this book are reflective also of the work that, he, that Hockney was doing at the time in opera, in designing the sets. Hockney made a, a number of productions uh, in, in, in the US and, and each one sort of introduced to him a whole new challenge of, of, of art making, of how to, to uh, enlighten, how to illuminate, how to um, make real art in, as a 3D space, a space where people could move through, a space where things happen over time. And these different challenges have brought to him a, a completely different feel from the, the paintings that he'd made earlier. Instead, we get these very bold, abstract shapes, almost as if they've been carved out of colour. Multiple perspectives, one of Hockney's uh, uh, favourite uh, things to play with. And reshaping space in a way that, that tricks the eye and that, that, that plays with some of the, the, the physical laws that we, that we see in, in more traditional painting. At the time, Hockney was mega famous, much as he is today. And uh, I think part of the, this new exploration of home printing, of getting out of the ateliers that he'd been working with for the etching suites that we'd seen before, and, and working at home feverishly, uh, was part of, a, of, of an escape from, from public life. Uh, Hockney's been very, very vocal about his continuing deafness. Uh, and at the time, it was difficult for him to go to large gatherings, to, to, to mass exhibitions, uh, to launches and openings. So the more that he could work from home, the more that he could work from within this comfortable space, uh, the better it was for him and the, and the more uh, creative he found himself. Visitors who, who, who came to the studio would often go home with, a, with an individual book or a, 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 a small edition that Hockney would print by himself in his own studio. Uh, explorations in, in photography and, and, and portraiture. This was one such book that was made specifically for a friend. This came from the collection of Brian Baggett, who was a, an early friend of, of Hockney's. Baggett was an air steward and uh, he couldn't afford any of Hockney's original work, so instead he started to collect Hockney's exhibition posters, uh, much like those that we see behind me here. Here's one for one of the many Operas that Hockney designed for. And over here, in this image of his Moncalm residency in LA, a space that he painted a number of times, you can see the influences that are in this book, the multiple perspectives, the sort of reinvigoration of the Cubist work that he'd been so inspired by by Barack and Picasso. Over the years, Baggett amassed a, a sizable collection of posters like these, uh, and they formed uh, a, the, the publication of a book that, that explored all of Hockney's work as a, as a, as a printer for, for exhibition posters. Uh, and late, uh, late in, uh, in Baggett's life, when his, his estate came to, to auction after his death, uh, this was one of the many unique treasures found within it. There's a particular image in here that I'd like to show you and which I think would be a nice moment to end on and that's this. This is really the only figurative 
image in this in this uh, this book of 18 images that have been uh, been produced on a, on a computer uh, and then printed by uh, by a laser printer. This is a familiar scene to those of you who might know Hockney's work. This is the, the sitting room in his Malibu beach house that he purchased in the in the mid 1980s as a sort of escape from uh, from the public. And he loved this place. He loved how close he was to the crash of the waves, the, mon the uh, mountains behind him, the sort of convergence of these two elemental forces. And it became a, a place of, of great solace uh, and isolation for him. Uh, a place where we might find him isolating today uh, uh, in, uh, in today's climate, perhaps. In a number of recent interviews, uh, Hockney has revealed that his hearing loss has deteriorated to the point where he can no longer enjoy music. And the upper registers and the lower registers uh, 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 can no longer be heard. And so he's left now only with the visual world, with his eyes, with the kind of looking and seeing that he's, he's spent his entire life doing. I think an image like this sort of captures an early moment of, of, of that joy of looking, of the joy of colour, this kind of Van Gogh, Matisse, mixtures of reds, greens and yellows. It's a, an image of a, of a safe and private space uh, in a book that was part of a, a private and personal exploration. And I think it confirms that for Hockney, looking, seeing, opening the world, opening your eyes to the world, has really been everything to his art, as it is still to this day. I think this is a really magical, unique piece in, in, in Hockney's uh, output. And I think it confirms the kind of joy and the warmth for which he has at times been ridiculed, but by most of us celebrated. <laughs>
to this lovely sort of glossy colour across the, the rest of the pot. And then another uh, very typical form, very difficult to throw, this is a baluster jug. So named because it looks a little bit like a, balustr a balustrade on a, on a castle or on, a, on a, a, um, a staircase with this lovely tall swelling shape. Nick has a, a number of tall forms in, in, in his repertoire, uh, including these jugs and also some very tall bottles, which are, which are really fantastic. And they, um, they give a completely different idea of the, the story of the, the, the flame in his, in his kilns, of the fire and ash that accumulates. Um, these would be uh, lying down. Some beautiful changes in colour across this shape. These typically would have been used in the, in the sort of medieval times for, for in kitchens, in pubs, for carrying water to be cooking with or for ale. Uh, beer doesn't go quite as flat when it's in a big tall jug like this and they were very economical to, to store because you could stand them up next to each other. But today it's a sort of lovely sculptural form that really shows off uh, a, a potter's finesse in, in getting in the clay to come this high uh, on the wheel, but also uh, it kind of, this kind of sculptural form, this lovely proud standing jug. Nick's firings are prolonged. They take place in an anagama kiln, which is like a, a very long chambered kiln. He explores all the time positioning of his pots within that space so that he gets the most out of the path of the flame that moves through the pots and also the accumulation of embers from, from stoking in the sides and at the front in the firebox. Nick also, uh, I think, relishes the different textures, the surface qualities that you get in a wood firing. And if all of these pots show something, it's that they, they have that kind of um, raw, primal feel to them. Some of these pots have got some, some very strange, very extreme features. If you look at something like this lovely jar, with this thick, thick chino glaze, and crusted on the side here are two pyrometric cones. There's a couple of pyrometric cones here, actually, that have melted. These uh, are what potters would use uh, within the kiln, placed in points where they can see them through, through stoke holes, to judge the, the temperature rise, the, the, the points at which the um, certain temperatures have been met. Once you reach a certain temperature, certain cones will fall, so you have a, an idea of, of whereabouts you are in the firing and whether you're, you need to uh, up or, or maintain the temperature. So there's a couple here that have been encrusted on this pot. And then if you look over here, something like this lovely large jar, with these beautiful little sort of spots of natural ash glaze that have, that have uh, occurred on the pot. These lovely blushes of colour, scallop shells to help the pot where it's been sitting, stop it from sticking to other pots and sticking to the kiln. You'll see in the clay itself there's a large sort of stone or, or sort of mineral deposit here. It's actually split the clay around it. These sorts of features you'll, you'll get in a lot of, pot, in, of Nick's pots. They have a kind of um, rugged sensibility to them. Nick is never one to play safe with, uh, with how he, uh, he, he puts work in his kiln. Um, and I think uh, he operates on the philosophy that if you don't sort of push that risk, if you don't uh, really push yourself in terms of what you think you can achieve, uh, uh, and, and risk the failures that he, that he often uh, uh, is, is cursed with, then you won't get uh, on the other, right, other side of the, the spectrum the, the uh, sort of fantastic successes. This lovely big dish, of which Nick makes a number, uh, I think is the perfect example of that. And it shows a couple of interesting points about his pottery. So if we lift it up, you can see the bed of scallop shells on which it's been sitting, which have kind of immolated and given these sort of wonderful ghost impressions on the, on the bottom of this pot. 
you can see where the ash has started to run over and dribble all around the edges. This, I think, is a dark meath clay, like this pot, which comes from the nearby quarry in, uh, near, near Oakhampton, near where, where Nick, uh, Nick, when it works in Devon. And then if I flip this over, this extraordinary surface where ash is, and, and embers have, have accumulated and piled and glassed and glazed. And actually, you'll see the remnants of other pots that were less lucky to survive Nick's firings. Because Nick plays it so, so, uh, plays so fast and loose with the, uh, the, the operation of his kiln, uh, trying to maintain a sort of con uh, controlled, out of control chaos. A lot of his pots will fuse together, uh, they'll be joined at the sides, and he'll be left with this very strange situation where he has to decide which of the pots to try and save and which to, uh, which to put to the hammer. I'd like to show you a, a short clip, five minutes, six minutes, of Nick uh, opening a, a firing back in, I think, 2014 uh, for one of his uh, exhibitions here at the gallery that gives uh, an idea of the kind of sacrifices that he has to make, but also the benefits of, of working so um, sort of so much at the, at the very edges of what you can achieve in wood firing and the, uh, the fantastic surface qualities, the variations in colour, these beautiful changes in in surface quality that you get with a prolonged wood firing. I think the good work has to ask questions. And if it asks questions of me, the maker, then how do other people see that work? You know, a lot of what I do we have all been programmed to think it's all seconds in ceramics, you know, when you get a dribbly glaze or a little mark on the pot from where another pot has touched it, you know, but without that touching it, then you wouldn't get all the colours around there. And of course, you're going to get a lot of disasters, but you are going to get one or two gems. So yeah, since the last show, I think I've, my pots are made to kind of capture or try to capture what will happen in my kiln. I can see there's a lot of damage in the front. Um, the wood we had when we were firing was short to pieces and it was difficult to stop it from bouncing around. And uh, so it knocked over quite a few pots. And although I tried to write the pots upright, you know, it's very difficult when the kiln's at 1300. So there's probably going to be quite a few pots stuck together in the front. And the way I stack the kiln this time as well, I stack pots on top of pots, which is great. Um, if it works, it works really well, but it's a big risk. And I think I've said before, you know, you only get the nice pots if you're willing to take the risk. So you have to be able to accept the failures that go with it along the way. So all I can do now is just carefully take things out. Some firing's almost perfect and others most of it's damaged. So, you know, to, to get one nice pot you may have to sacrifice three or four. 
Um, but that's the way it is. One way of unpacking the kiln, huh? Put it down. I was in the fortunate position because the bulk, well, the pots are up for the exhibition okay. anyway. So whatever I do now is a bonus. So I wanted to um, stack the kiln a bit more loosely, a bit more uh, to risk. And that's exactly what's happened. And I just need to take my time and really be careful on the cleaning now and rescue these special pots. Because they're here. <clears throat> um, we can usually get them apart, but there's usually one obvious one to sacrifice. And when you've got two beautiful ones stuck together, it becomes a bit of a a dilemma, but these two here, as you can see, this this jar is very nice, and um, I often get nice taller bottles, so I may have to put a hammer to the bottle. Doesn't that make that one twice as special? Yeah, I need to be very careful with this because this is a special pot. One that you don't see that often. A good pot is like a good storybook, isn't it? It's it's recording four days of its its journey from clay to a pot. All that turbulent flame and the way it's packed and fired and blah 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 but you have to be able to read that story and I'm beginning to break that code but you know we could play safe pop it all in a gas kiln nothing against gas kilns it's just an example and or indeed in the wood kiln I could stack things in there and play a lot safer and get 10 times as much work out of it. But they wouldn't carry that special. It would just be like more like a production line rather than the kiln giving me a gift. Easy. Mm -hmm. Only when it comes out the firing. <laughs> yep, that's just the beginning. Well, I hope that gives you some idea of the, the, the sheer amount of, um, of effort and, um, and pain and sacrifice that goes into what Nick does. Um, I think it, it, it really has to be sort of brought home by, by Nick himself and, and showing um, that amazing footage of him, of him destroying those, uh, those less fortunate pots. We'll be back again later this week. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying our broadcast. Do please let us know if there's anything that you'd like to see, uh, if you've got any ideas for things that we'd like to, to, to show you. Um, in the meantime, everything that you've seen today is available on our website, so do be in touch, please. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. So so, hi everybody, I hope it's not too bad where you are. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing you all on Monday. I'll practice my English because it's a bit rusty. Take care. Uh, uh, educate, entertain our customers.
Okay, so now we're going to look at some other of his prints. I'm thinking very seriously about stopping making pots. There's nothing forced. And I think his jugs are, are really the epitome of that. Hello, welcome to today's broadcast from the Goldmark Gallery. One of my most regular places to visit up in this part of the world is the Goldmark Gallery. 